I mean, yeah. you know, uh, depends. Uh, also, Kayla, can you post the YouTube link in the chat? Yep, will do. It is setting up right now. All right, so most of the people are going to join on YouTube because that's the link we pushed the most. Uh, but I do see some people who joined us here in Zoom. Hi, folks, how are you doing? Um, do people want to share where they're joining from in the chat? Nice. I see a lot of West Coast people. I'm also, oh, someone from France. That's awesome. Uh, so I'm probably going to mess up your name, Matisse, uh, but you're doing an amazing report for us, which I'm super excited about. Um, maybe you should come give a talk soon. That would be kind of cool. Uh, also, for the folks who are joining us, um, thank you for coming. Um, there's a Q&A button. For the folks who are on Zoom, there's a Q&A button. You can use that to ask questions. We have three talks for you today. Uh, each will run about 30 minutes, after which you can ask questions. Um, you can also post them in the chat. The folks who are joining us on YouTube, you can ask the questions either in the YouTube comments or in the YouTube chat, and we'll get your questions and ask them. Uh, Kayla, how's the YouTube numbers? How are they doing? Can we start? We are, yeah, we got four people watching right now. Um, did I, did you get that link? Post yeah, let me then. share that link out to people. Okay. Uh, all right, so we can begin and I'm gonna start tweeting while Lucas introduces you guys. All right, sounds good. Um, Thanks, Lavanya, and um, thanks everyone for coming to, to watch this. I think this should be pretty fun. Um, we have uh, three talks today, and I'm excited about all of them. Um, so first up, we have Alex from OpenAI, um, who worked on the robotic hand, and we got to hear snippets of making the hand do a Rubik's Cube over the years working with OpenAI, and so we were so excited when the hand finally made that Rubik's Cube work, and so I'm, I'm actually really excited to hear about um, what happened behind the scenes to make that possible, because I know you all worked really hard on that. Um, and then we have Zhang, who's um, uh, finished his PhD uh, at Stanford in, in natural language processing, and then took some of his work and made um, a company called uh, Sapling that um, corrects, your, uh, corrects your language and your text. And I actually use it all the time. Um, I have it in my browser, and it saved me from sending a lot of very embarrassing um, emails. So um, so I'm, I'm actually also curious to hear. I think the, the going from research to running a startup is something that probably some of the people watching aspire to. Um, and it's a, a jarring experience. And I'd love to hear <laughs> more about how that's been for you. Um, and then finally, we have our own um, Stacy, who um, has given um gave a, a really awesome talk last time and uh is going to talk about um hyperparameter tuning um and i can't wait to see that one too hyperparameter tuning is something people always ask us about um and she's gonna have some practical advice for you so um shall we get started alex is up first okay cool thank you get my screen share going Do you see just my slide? Yep. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's make sure. Okay. Uh, let me make sure it's working. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so you're going. So hi everyone. Uh, yeah, as Lucas said, uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm a member of the robotics team at OpenAI. Uh, tonight I'll be talking about our progress uh, towards learning to solve dexterous manipulation tasks with a humanoid robotic hand. Uh, so 
Specifically, uh, I'll begin by discussing the motivation for this line of research, kind of what it means, uh, this research on dexterity, and we'll then describe our two most recent big releases, uh, Learning Dexterity from summer of 2018 and Solving Rubik's Cube uh, released this past fall. Uh, at the end, I'll add a small update with some more recent research we did uh, kind of along the same uh, research agenda. Okay, so let's begin uh, with uh, the motivation for this uh, line of research overall. Uh, so the goal of robotics at OpenAI uh, is to build a general purpose robot. Uh, that is one that can operate in the complex environment of the real world and carry out most tasks that humans can do. Today's robots are still pretty far away from this. Uh, so most consumer oriented robots are either very simple toys or tend to focus on uh, primarily obstacle avoidance, uh, which are things like Roombas, uh, self-driving cars or autonomous drones. Uh, these are challenging in their own right and certainly very difficult problems, uh, especially with self-driving cars. Uh, they do not interact with their environment to the level that we're after. Um, kind of on the other end of the spectrum are complicated robots which do interact with their environment, such as in manufacturing or surgical robotics. Uh, however, today almost all of these are either executing just hard-coded behavior, pre-recorded trajectories, or are being controlled by a human. Building a general purpose robot is a daunting task though, so we had to pick somewhere to start. Uh, we chose to focus on dexterity and specifically dexterity of humanoid robotic hands for a couple of reasons. First, uh, the human hand is able to solve a huge array of tasks and uh, the world we've constructed is designed to a large extent uh, around the human hand. Uh, second, while the necessary hardware for uh, kind of doing this, so anthropomorphic uh, robotic hands, has existed for a while, it has found little real world use uh, due to the very high difficulty in creating software capable of controlling this hardware. Uh, so why is it hard? Uh, the main source of difficulty stems from the high complexity of the robots that are involved. Uh, for example, the robot that we've been using through this line of research, uh, the Shadow Hand, uh, has 24 degrees of freedom and 20 actuators. Uh, this is much higher than the like seven or eight uh, degrees of freedom that you typically see with robotic arms used in manufacturing. Uh, and also when coupled with a relatively small form factor, this leads to a very complicated and generally less precise hardware, which in turn is very difficult to simulate accurately. Uh, so that's kind of very quick motivation. Uh, with that, we can go ahead and start talking about the first set of results that I want to describe to you all tonight. Uh, this is uh, Learning Dexterity, uh, which we released in summer of 2018, uh, work done by all the fine folks that are listed here. Uh, note that I hadn't joined OpenAI yet at the time. Um, so this is our first project using the shadow hand. Uh, so we decided to start with a relatively simple task uh, of reorienting a wooden block as pictured here. Uh, so uh, with that we can go ahead and start talking about how we did this. Uh, so our High level approach was uh, to use reinforcement learning to train a policy which then controls the robot. Uh, so over the past I think, like five or so years, uh, reinforcement learning has proven to be inc incredibly powerful uh, from the success with AlphaGo uh, to more recently with uh, the success of OpenAI 5, um, it's from where I'm working. Uh, but these approaches are incredibly data hungry. Uh, so you need a huge amount of training data to get these approaches to work. Uh, and for robotics, this is particularly challenging uh, since collecting this huge amount of data uh, for training the robots is both difficult and expensive. Uh, so here we have a video uh, from I think Google's so-called arm farm uh, where they uh, basically did try to build out a huge array of robots and train in the real world. Um, and I guess this is a sped up video, but you, you see there's uh, kind of a lot going on here. There's, it's, it's a very expensive setup to maintain and it's still kind of difficult to get working. Uh, so instead of going down that route, uh, we've decided to take what is called the sim to real approach, uh, which means that we train our control policy entirely in simulation uh, using a physics simulator and then deploy it onto the physical robot. Uh, this is much cheaper and far more scalable than training directly in the real world, uh, but it does come with its own set of challenges, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, so here we have a, a video of, uh, from this physics simulator that we use. Uh, so specifically, this is from the Mujoko physics engine. Uh, and the video is showing our policy controlling the shadow hand here, uh, trying to solve the block reorientation task. Uh, so on the right hand side of the video, you see uh, this kind of transparent block uh, that's like kind of moving, looks like it's moving around. Uh, what's happening here is that uh, this is the desired orientation for the block. Uh, 
Uh, and once the hand is able to manipulate the block into this position, uh, we sample a new goal for it uh, to achieve. And this kind of continues uh, uh, until we get to either like 50 successes, uh, so 50 goals achieved, or we uh, drop the block. Uh, that's our simulation environment. Uh, so now let's take a quick look at our real world setup. Um, so the picture here is of what we call our cages uh, for running uh, robotic experiments. Um, so uh, the hand here is in the middle. Uh, you can see it's surrounded by a very large number of cameras. Uh, so most of the cameras uh, here are for the face-based motion tracking system. Uh, they think there's like 24 in total. Um, and that's used for some additional like sensory input into the policy. Um, only three of the cameras pictured here are uh, normal RGB cameras. Uh, so these are the ones that are circled on the image. Uh, the most relevant piece for this talk is that these three RGB cameras uh, are ultimately fed into a vision model, which is then used to produce uh, an estimate of the location and the orientation of the block, uh, which is then passed on to the policy when we deploy the real world. Um, so what this means is that the vision model we train must also be capable uh, of achieving the sim to real transfer. Uh, so the problem with the sim to real approach uh, is that it's hard. Uh, it's very hard. It's hard because it's impossible to perfectly model the complicated robotic systems accurately, which means that policies trained in simulation generally perform very poorly in the real world. Uh, in general, this problem is known as the sim to real or reality gap. So rather than working endlessly to make the physics simulation closer to reality, we can instead employ a technique called domain randomization to force the policy to learn behaviors which generalize to a wide range of environments rather than overfitting to any single environment. One of the earliest examples of this technique from Sadagi and Eleven is pictured here. Uh, they trained a policy uh, to fly a drone in simulation on environments with a wide variety of textures rendered on uh, the furniture and the walls and the environment. Uh, and this allowed the policy to then transfer and work in the real world without having seen any real data. Um, at OpenAI, uh, in 2017, we used roughly the same approach to train a vision model uh, to predict the, an object's orient, position, position and orientation uh, entirely in simulation. Um, as you can see from this video, we're able to actually use uh, kind of pretty crazy looking uh, textures uh, randomized um, like onto the objects and everything in the scene. Uh, and thanks to uh, kind of the magic of domain randomization, this model is then able to transfer to the real world. Uh, so we took a similar approach then with learning dexterity. Uh, so for uh, this release, we had two different types of domain randomizations uh, that you see displayed here. So on the left, you have uh, the physics randomizations. Um, these are things like the friction coefficient, the object sizes, uh, even like gravitational force, et cetera. And on the right, you see uh, the visual randomizations which are uh, critical for trading the vision model, uh, which I previously mentioned. Um, here, uh, we use a different rendering approach than the previous video. So we use the Unity game engine here to render uh, more realistic looking images and kind of higher resolution, higher uh, fidelity. Um, and each column uh, you see on the right-hand side, uh, it represents one single sample fed into the model. Um, so from each of the three cameras that I pointed out earlier, uh, the job of the vision model is then to predict the pose of the block, so the position and the orientation uh, given this image. Uh, so with this approach to training and simulation with domain randomization in mind, uh, this we, we now talk about how we ultimately train our models. Um, so this diagram here is kind of describing the rough like flow of how it works. Uh, so uh, both the policy and the vision model training use uh, an internal framework called RAPID, which was originally developed for the OpenAI 5 bot, um, but has since been used uh, throughout OpenAI for a lot of uh, reinforcement learning projects. Uh, note that we train the control policy here using reinforcement learning with state-based observations uh, rather than uh, from images. Uh, the reason we do this uh, is basically because it's easy to get these state-based uh, observations. So that is like the position and orientation of the block uh, from the simulator. Uh, and it's much, much easier uh, in terms of this like kind of complexity of setup as well as the amount of compute required to train the LSTM policy from state uh, rather than from images. Um, however, as I mentioned before, uh, we have this, uh, in the real world, we have to use a vision model to uh, predict the pose of the block. So uh, we also use the same rapid framework uh, to uh, 
uh, train this vision model using, again, a highly, highly similar uh, distributed system setup. And then once we've uh, trained using this setup for long enough, we can then deploy it to the real robot. Uh, to do this, we uh, finally combine the vision model with uh, the policy. So we have the uh, vision model process, uh, the real frames uh, images from the cameras mounted around the cage. Uh, and this predicts this produces uh, an estimated pose, which is then passed along to the LSTM policy, which ultimately produces actions which control the robotic hand. Uh, so that's how it works. Now let's see the system in action. Um, so, oh, there's audio. <laughs> uh, so yeah, here's an example of our system performing object reorientation on a physical hand. On the right uh, is the desired orientation of the block. Once it's achieved, uh, we randomly sample a different goal. Sorry, I did not realize there's audio for this video. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, this goes on for a long time, seven full minutes of uh, 50 successful goals achieved. You can view the whole thing on YouTube later if you're curious. Um, so to take away the music now. Uh, so we also quantified uh, the performance of our system. Uh, so we measured the median and maximum number of successfully achieved goals over 10 trials on the real robot uh, with a few different setups uh, considered. Uh, so we can see here that the domain randomization is absolutely critical to success. Uh, we get basically no uh, transfer performance, uh, even from an LSTM based policy uh, without domain randomization. Uh, we also find uh, that the LSTM uh, greatly outperforms a standard feed forward model. Uh, we believe that this is due to the memory present in an LSTM, which when coupled with our training approach allows for what we've been calling uh, emergent meta learning uh, or domain adaptation. Uh, so a bit more on that later. Uh, okay, so that's it for the learning dexterity release. Uh, now we'll fast forward to fall of last year when we released our work on manipulating Rubik's cube uh, using the same physical setup. So in this work, uh, we use a shadow hand to solve Rubik's cube. Uh, we chose this specific task because it built directly on the previous work uh, while also taking the difficulty of the manipulation problem up several notches. Uh, before we dive into the details here, I just want to clarify uh, the, the goals that we had with this project when we set out to do it, um, which you can see here. So the primary goal was to push the limits of sim to real transfer on an incredibly difficult dexterous manipulation task. Uh, note that we didn't care uh, for this project about learning to solve the Rubik's Cube symbolically as this only seemed tangential to our real research agenda around dexterity. Okay, uh, now for some details. Um, so I guess just to start, at a high level, we leverage the same approach uh, from the previous release on learning dexterity. So basically, we try to combine sim to real with domain randomization. Uh, we use an LSTM policy and a vision model uh, separately trained in simulation um, and all of this. So uh, one early surprise of the project uh, was that it was surprisingly easy to solve this task in a simulator using a very simplified model of Rubik's Cube, as you can see here. Um, however, it turned out to be incredibly difficult uh, to transfer this policy to the real robot, as you can see from the video struggling there. Um, so basically, we had a much harder sim to real problem uh, compared to the previous work. So at first, uh, like I had mentioned, we were just trying the same combination of reinforcement learning and domain randomization from learning dexterity. However, we quickly found that for this project, uh, domain randomization just was not scaling well enough. Uh, so we ended up having to continue to add so many more parameters that needed to be randomized uh, such that we couldn't feasibly set the correct ranges for each of them uh, correctly by hand. It just simply wasn't scalable. So instead, we introduced what we call automatic domain randomization, or ADR, uh, to discover the correct ranges for each parameter for us automatically. So I'll now quickly describe uh, what ADR does. Uh, so to begin, we can consider a non-domain randomization approach, which would consist of a single point in the space of domain randomization parameters corresponding to our best guess for the real value of these parameters. Uh, so what this means is you might try to like measure uh, the friction coefficients uh, of the surfaces, you would use like the actual value of gravity on Earth, things like this. Uh, with domain randomization, we would define a fixed uh, box sorts around the starting point uh, in uh, domain randomization parameter space. So these, the box you know, corresponding to the, the fixed ranges um, in the high dimensional space. Uh, with ADR, we're able to start uh, with conservative initial ranges and then grow them automatically according to how well the policy performs 
rather than trying to initialize them to the perfect like maximal values. Uh, specifically, it does this by occasionally sampling each domain randomization parameter at its lower or upper bound, and then evaluates the performance of the policy on the resulting environment. If the policy does well enough, ADR will then expand this bound in the direction that it was sampling. Uh, so if you run this for long enough, it kind of gradually uh, grows this, this box uh, and parameter space um, much farther than we had previously been able to tune it uh, by hand, uh, in part because ADR also kind of gives us an implicit curriculum uh, over these environments. So as things get more, like over time, the, generally the, the environments that you're trying to solve become more and more difficult. So uh, here we see an example of ADR at work on the domain randomization parameter governing the size of the queue. Uh, so you can see ADR allows us to initialize uh, this parameter just to the actual size of the cube. And then over time, the policy is able to uh, work with not just this size of the cube, but also one that's quite a bit bigger and quite a bit smaller uh, than the real size. Uh, but this is just one parameter. So again, the point of ADR is that we have so many parameters to tune that we can't do it by hand. Uh, so here you see the complete set listed out uh, from some internal analytics. Uh, it would be quite a pain to tune all of these perfectly by hand. And it's probably just not really a feasible thing to do given compute constraints. Um, so I can talk a little bit about how we actually then trained it. So it's uh, largely the same setup. So again, we use the internal framework we call RAPID uh, to separately train an LSTM policy and uh, a convolutional neural net vision model and simulation. Uh, we then combine them in the same way to deploy to the real robot. Uh, so now for the results. Uh, so after much trial and error, uh, basically much, much trial and error, uh, we finally got it working uh, kind of early summer of last year. Uh, so here we have a video of the shadow hand successfully solving Rubik's Cube from a fair scramble. Um, so as of the last one, it takes a few minutes at real time speed. So I won't show the whole thing now, uh, but the video is also on YouTube and it's also linked from our blog. So I encourage you to check it out there if you're curious. Uh, so. Once we did this, we also ran some fun uh, robustness experiments to kind of test the limits uh, of the domain randomization we employed, uh, including things like tying the fingers together, uh, putting a rubber glove on the hand, uh, or the uh, perennial fan favorite, the uh, plush giraffe perturbation. Uh, uh, note that none of these perturbations were included in the training data, uh, particularly the plush giraffe. That would be way too much work. Uh, we also did some analysis to better understand how ADR related uh, to performance on the real robot. Uh, so here we measure the size of the domain randomization parameter box uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, by the entropy of the distribution. So basically a higher entropy here means that ADR has expanded uh, the parameter space more. So we've covered uh, the policy has effectively solved more environments. Uh, encouragingly, when we ran this analysis, we found a correlation between this ADR entropy and the mean number of successes achieved in real roll rollouts. Um, so since we did this in the real world, we unfortunately don't have a, a huge amount of, of data, but uh, I think that the trend here we see is, is pretty clear and it's, uh, it's pretty uh, exciting to us uh, that ADR has this property. Uh, we also did a lot of analysis for the paper studying the emergence of uh, meta-learning capabilities in our policy. Uh, so in our case, uh, what we mean by meta-learning is that the policy has learned how to infer the parameters of its environment uh, so that it can adapt and more efficiently solve the task. Uh, so one piece of evidence for this meta-learning uh, is presented here, uh, where we attempt to measure whether the hidden state of the LSTM, so basically uh, at the end of a rollout, we capture uh, this vector that's uh, the memory of the model, like what is you know, kind of what is the state of it at the end of a rollout, uh, and try to determine if it has information about uh, the size of the cube that it's tasked with solving. Uh, so uh, of course we did this in simulation where we can easily uh, vary the size of the cube uh, automatically uh, across a wider range. Uh, so in this table, the rightmost column here is the accuracy that we obtained uh, from a linear classifier that's fit atop this hidden state, this memory, uh, to predict whether the cube size is above or below uh, the mean size of the cube. Um, so this being uh, just a, a binary classifier, the, the like random prediction accuracy would be 0.5. So the fact that we see all of these above, uh, well above 0.5, um, you know, in the confidence interval being above 0.5 is pretty encouraging. It tells us that uh, this information is contained within the memory. So the policy has 
learned how to uh, learn about the environment and first state about the environment. Um, and again, uh, it was exciting to see that uh, this accuracy only increased as uh, we ran for longer uh, and basically had a, a higher ADR volume. So, uh, and yeah, that wraps up the discussion of our most recent two big releases. Uh, for more info in each, uh, I definitely just skimmed the surface here. Uh, there's tons more in both papers that are on archive uh, and also more information in our blog. So I encourage you to check those out. Uh, finally, we'll now discuss uh, kind of a smaller uh, result uh, from some work completed at the beginning of this year, which was published recently uh, in a weights and biases report that's pictured on the right here and linked uh, below. So uh, for this result, uh, once we had shipped the Rubik's Cube results, we decided to do a brief investigation into whether we could train a policy directly from images, aka end-to-end, -end, uh, cutting out the need for a separate vision model. Uh, this means the policy architecture, both in training and when run on the real robot, uh, looks like this, where uh, effectively, instead of having the vision uh, convolutional, convolutional neural network produce an estimate of the block pose, you have it uh, produce some embedding in a higher dimensional space representing the state of the environment, which is then directly fed into the policy, um, which then again produces actions. Um, so the important property here is that when you're training the model, you're able to backprop all the way through uh, the vision stack to learn the optimal representation for uh, the policy. So uh, for this investigation, we chose the block reorientation test uh, from the learning dexterity release that I talked about, uh, just because it's much simpler uh, to solve relative to the Rubik's cube. We decided to start uh, by trying uh, behavioral cloning to more quickly train such a policy. Uh, so behavioral cloning works by first uh, training a state-based policy as was done in the learning dexterity release, uh, which is then used uh, to effectively teach uh, a new end-to-end uh, -end student policy uh, how to behave. Uh, so concretely what this means is you uh, allow the end-to-end uh, -end policy to uh, do its rollouts. So it'll try to act in the environment uh, just as you would in a typical RL setting. Uh, but then when you do optimization, uh, instead of uh, using something like uh, PPO or any kind of like policy gradient uh, technique like we, we've uh, been using for our past two releases, uh, you instead uh, sample the uh, kind of optimal uh, actions from your teacher uh, model. So in this case, the state-based model, uh, and then uh, coerce the student uh, policy to behave like the teacher would have uh, in any given situation. Um, so uh, this effectively uh, replaces a reinforcement learning problem with a supervised learning problem, uh, where the policy gets direct supervision on its actions at every single time step. Um, and with this kind of swap to supervised learning, you get a number of benefits uh, related to uh, training speed and just the general ease of the problem, uh, which sure mentioned here. So um, basically, this this made uh, this whole investigation much quicker and cheaper uh, to perform. Um, and we already knew that behavioral cloning uh, had a good shot at working because we've been using this technique uh, within the team uh, for over a year now uh, to do other kinds of experimentation. Uh, and long story short, again, after a lot of debugging, uh, which is honestly 90% of this job, uh, we were finally able to get this working. Uh, so once we had a basic setup working, we then used uh, behavioral cloning to run a number of ablations uh, to find the optimal setup. Uh, so cloning was key here as it allowed us to more quickly run these ablations. Uh, so there are a few more that are listed in the report and a few that require a bit more context to set up. Um, but I think the most interesting and quick to explain uh, ablation we ran here was on using a pre-trained vision model. Um, so here uh, in green, we have a uh, kind of a from scratch behavioral cloning run with a randomly initialized vision model. And then in pink, we have a run where we initialize the vision uh, model uh, with the parameters from an already trained uh, vision model that was taken basically from the, the same vision model we used for the learning dexterity release. Um, so interestingly, we see a, a 4x speed up. Uh, I think it's not surprising we would see some speed up, but I think it's interesting that uh, the nature of the speed up, it's basically uh, eliminating this uh, kind of flat, like long uh, stretch that you see with the green curve here. Um, during which time we're hypothesizing that maybe the, the policy is struggling to uh, kind of uh, learn the right representation uh, of uh, its environment. Uh, so once we had this optimal setup uh, for doing behavioral cloning, we then kind of used it 
to run a single very large uh, reinforcement learning experiment. Um, so again, like basically from scratch, except for uh, using a pre-trained vision stack. Uh, so in green here, we have uh, the uh, RL experiment. Uh, and in pink, we had the behavioral cloning. Um, oh, and sorry, uh, I realized I forgot to mention what these plots uh, denote. But on, on the y-axis here, we have uh, the mean episodic reward. Uh, and on the x-axis, we have the uh, amount of frames collected. So basically, the amount of uh, training experience that has gone into the model. Uh, so from this plot, uh, you can see that it, there's a huge gap uh, in how much experience it takes to converge. Um, so uh, the uh, like total amount that it comes out to is about 30x more compute uh, for the reinforcement learning experiment than behavioral cloning. Uh, so this is just kind of a useful result to keep in mind uh, for us for future projects. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Nice. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, do people have questions? If you can pop, uh, pop it up in the chat um, or the QA button if you're on Zoom. I know Charles has a question. Yeah. Um, so it's really uh, cool work and very impressive, like getting, you know, there's lots of difficult aspects to reinforcement learning and to robotics and to get them to both work together is really cool. Uh, the question I have uh, is one of the like salient features of the human motor system, especially the dexterity is haptic feedback. Like I get a bunch of information from my joints about the amount of tension, uh, about their position, about their relative orientation and like, you know, whatever massive data stream we get from our mm -hmm. skin. So I'm curious to what degree do folks at, are folks at OpenAI interested in incorporating haptic feedback to future versions of this? Or was its exclusion like a very, like, a, yeah, met because it's not helpful or something like that? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. So I think uh, there's a few aspects to this. Uh, the first is that uh, the, the hardware, I think, for this, this kind of sensing is a little more finicky to work with. Um, so the shadow hand actually does come with some of these uh, sensors. I believe they're like, uh, gosh, I can't remember the exact term, but there's basically pressure sensors in, in the fingers, like at each digit. Um, but they're very like kind of sensitive to all kinds of factors, uh, like like air pressure or like um, uh, kind of other like things that uh, lead to them being very noisy, uh, which has made them like more difficult to incorporate. Uh, and then I think. Basically, uh, because of this, like it's also a little more difficult to exactly simulate the dynamics with them. Uh, so, like uh, I think the way the shadow hand work is there is these little kind of like balloons of um, I don't know if it was actually just air or some other gas uh, that would that kind of compress slightly and it would measure that. So that throws off the dynamics a little bit. Um, but I think longer term, it's definitely a thing that we're interested in because clearly it, it's very critical to humans. Um, like we've we've even tried I think uh, or we joked around uh, on the team of like trying a uh, to like these like numbing agents you can put on your hand and see if we can still do some of these tasks and like uh, we generally think like it's it's a lot more difficult. Cool. Thanks. Um, cool. I guess the other uh, it, we also have a tremendous amount of experience working with uh, vision like in the ML community like we have convolutional neural nets that are this like you know sort of super weapon for handling vision tasks. So do you also think it's a matter of algorithmic development that we need better tools for handling the kinds of input streams that things like haptic sensors provide? Or do you think that we have that technology figured out? Mm, that's interesting. Um, I would guess that uh, that won't be the blocker anytime soon for this, um, but we haven't, we haven't tested it as, as well. All right, we've got a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, Salim asks, uh, did you run behavioral uh, coding for the same number of frames uh, as RL? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I see, I think I see the question. So like two, uh, two billion or three billion, uh, maybe it'll get better. I think there's another question I see related to um, the RL being better at the end. So this was a kind of a difficulty in constructing the plot. So um, I was showing the mean reward obtained during training, uh, but we also have like a separate uh, set of kind of evaluation on like a kind of the maximally difficult environment. Um, and we find that uh, the, basically the reason we stopped the behavioral cloning experiment when we did is because it had already fully solved the environment. So with uh, like the median um, performance was 50 successes out of 50. 
Uh, so the, the reward can go a little bit higher because you get um, I think benefits for, for other things, but uh, it didn't matter for us at this point. Gotcha. Um, someone, uh, Matis asks, uh, how is it like to work on such big projects? Uh, isn't it hard to get the full picture of what you're doing sometimes? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, I, I personally really enjoy working on these big projects. Um, I think for robotics, uh, I can't really see like a, a way of solving really hard problems without having like a bunch of people focusing on it just because there's so much to figure out on the stack um, from, you know, getting the firmware right, uh, getting the physical hardware set up right, um, and all the way up to like, you know, designing the right, uh, like using the right reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, so I, I agree, it, it can be harder to like understand fully what's going on. Um, I mean, I don't have full context on everything the mechanical engineers do on our team. Um, but I also think that's kind of fun because you there's more opportunity to learn new stuff. What are some of the tools you're using to understand what's going on with these models? Um, yeah, so I guess the tooling we use, uh, so yeah, like I, I mentioned, we use weights and biases a lot for, uh, for sharing the reports. Um, and kind of like discussing uh, reports uh, results internally. Um, the like tech stack, I guess, I don't if that's the question, uh, is uh, uh, we're using PyTorch uh, to train these uh, these models, um, which we've really enjoyed using. Um, and then we have like a bunch of internal stuff as well. Uh, so Han asks, uh, how does domain randomization relate to data augmentation schedules uh, and how would the search and the reinforcement learning space translate to image tasks? Interesting. So I think, yeah, there is, I guess, a, a sense in which there's a relation between domain and randomization and data augmentation. Um, I don't know as much about the schedules here uh, that Han that refers to. Um, I'm not like that expert in that field, but I guess the, the key difference here is that with data augmentation, I guess you're starting with uh, some real world data and then you're, you're perturbing it in some way to get uh, basically more data. Whereas in our case, everything is coming from a simulation. Um, so you don't really need to view it as like augmentation as much, um, but there's definitely a relationship there. Uh What's the team vision with this project, maybe in a year or two? Um, yeah, so I can't really talk too much about like uh, future work beyond like what I shared with uh, the motivation. Um, and aside from just like our, our overarching goal around burning, building a general purpose robot. Uh, does uh, OpenAI plan on building CARES like Open a uh, APIs for reinforcement learning? Um, I don't, well, I don't think we'd have something like a like Keras. I think the, the closest answer maybe is that we have uh, this uh, release called OpenAI baselines, which are kind of uh, like good standard implementations of RL algorithms. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the closest maybe. Nice. I also encourage the YouTube folks to ask questions. Right now, the Zoom folks are asking all the questions. Uh, but this one question does come from YouTube. What was your most important learning in this project? Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, so I, I only joined uh, kind of March of last year. I think the most interesting thing to see was that uh, a lot of these, um, the problems that we ended up solving, uh, they felt at the end of the day, kind of like more like engineering problems that we had to figure out. So what was really cool to see was that uh, basically when we go from learning dexterity to solving the Rubik's cube, uh, the same, roughly the same formula worked, right? So we, we used reinforcement learning with domain randomization. Um, uh, we introduced ADR, uh, which is critical to success too. Um, but at a high level, the same approach worked. We just had to figure out how to run it at the right scale and kind of solve a lot of engineering problems. Um, so I think that was really encouraging because I think like the promise for these approaches is, uh, is very high for challenging tasks. Nice. Uh, last question. This is just uh, me wondering, did uh, working on this project change uh, how you do machine learning or change what you think of as best practices, but are not, or you discovered new best practices? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, let's see. So I think 
the interesting thing for me jumping on this project, so my background before this was more in applied machine learning, working on uh, sort of fraud detection. Um, so there, uh, the there's far less emphasis on the algorithms themselves. Basically, all of the uh, the work that you end up doing um, is in getting better data in or like better features. Um, so I think what's been interesting to see is that uh, with this work, we also like generally don't worry too much about the algorithms themselves. Uh, like you know, we've been using um, PPO for all of these results is a great uh, you know policy gradient method. It's um, so that works really well. Uh, the main thing that we you know, do end up having to worry about uh, is again, uh, the data that we're training on uh, only in this case, we have complete control over it. Um, it's all coming from a simulator. Uh, but I think it was just, it was interesting to note that it's, it's still just like the data that you're trading on that ends up mattering the most. So. Cool. Wait, I have one more question and then we'll end it. Uh, <laughs> so why, why did you pick the Rubik's Cube as the go-to problem to prove that the robot hand worked? Yeah, so I, I wasn't around for when we actually picked this. Um, my understanding is that uh, it's it's basically uh, something that I, I think is roughly like the most difficult like single-handed manipulation task that you can think of. Um, so, uh, like, with, like basically, if you have like a you know your wrist your wrist in a fixed position and you like have to do something uh, with just like your fingers, like it's uh, it's about as hard as you can imagine. Um, and it's also something that uh, kind of, I think, has been floated around. Like the idea of it has been like mentioned in the robotics community. And you'll sometimes see like, you know, stock photos like a robot it can, like a Rubik's cube next to it. Um, but no one's like really made a serious effort towards solving it. So I think, uh, you know, the kind of assumption that it would be too difficult to solve was like attractive. Nice. Uh, I have a, actually one little quick more <laughs> follow up. So um, in uh, one uh, one closely related world uh, that I'm more familiar with is the neuroprosthetics world, like the goal of generating, of allowing human neural networks to control robotic hands. And one of the tasks that turned out to be most difficult for that and that required haptic feedback was the manipulation of soft objects and like mm -hmm. things that are much more deformable than a Rubik's cube. So can you say anything about your experience using this setup and these algorithms for those kinds of tasks, like, you know, handling an egg or a Play-Doh or something like that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point. So one of the uh, difficult parts with training entirely in simulation is that simulators uh, today at least are uh, not as good at, at modeling deformable objects. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, you end up having way too many contact points and uh, it becomes like really expensive. Um, so we haven't really focused on this quite as much. Um, I think it's something where we believe like uh, once we push our sim to real approach far enough, we'll be able to, to do it. But yeah, it's, it's not a thing we've uh, attempted too much yet. Cool, all right, thank you, Alex. Uh, so Alex is also gonna be doing an AMA soon in our community and we'll tweet about it slash post it in the community. So you guys can come and ask him more questions because obviously we've got so many, uh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, next up, we, we have Zhang. Uh, Zhang did his PhD in natural language processing from uh, Stanford. Uh, he's now the co-founder of sapling.ai. Um, and today he's going to talk about the challenges that uh, you face in taking natural language processing models from research to production. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, let me share my screen really quick. Okay, now full screen. So can everyone see the, uh, the first slide? Yeah. Awesome, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just gonna give a little bit more background because I think it's relevant for the rest of the talk. So we're building an AI layer for chat, um, texts, tickets, emails. And so part of that involves deploying language models. It involves deploying these deep encoder decoder models and more recently, uh, more QA style models as well. And so um, James and I who work on this, uh, starting out, we, we encounter lots of issues, uh, just trying to go from you know, what you see described in a research paper towards something that you can deploy and have other people use. 
Um, so I actually recorded us early on during one of our discussions, uh, just us working on this during a particularly hectic stretch. Um, and so let me play that for you. I should say uh, it, it's a little bit, actually it, it might be a little bit loud, but I may not have shared audio, which, which is also fine. But if I did share audio, it might be a little bit loud. <laughs> just fair warning. All right, so, so obviously that wasn't us, but pretty close, pretty close. Um, that's more or less how it feels like sometimes when we're taking these models and putting them out for people to use. Uh, but fortunately, you know, the first time around, it, it was pretty much like this, really hectic. But for the second and third model types that I talked about, each time we were able to deploy things and uh, get things, scale things on our cluster much more quickly, much more smoothly. And so it, it appears at least as though we're learning something in, in this process of deploying the different systems. Um, and so this talk is really describing uh, our learnings. Um, so I wanted to focus actually around three high level themes. Uh, so the themes are cursive dimensionality, iteration time and opaque models. And I know that Many people watching are probably familiar with these. They probably encountered these. You know, these are not specific to NLP, um, although I describe this as a talk focusing on NLP. Uh, but although I think these are themes that are quite familiar, you know, after quite a number of years working on applied AI, applied ML, these are still a few of the themes that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Uh, that I learn new things about every month um, and that I'm still gaining new perspectives on. So, uh, you know, research, new papers are, are going on archive quite frequently, but I don't think these are three issues that are going to go away if you're trying to take NLP models from research to production. All right, so with that, let's talk about cursive dimensionality. Um, so I'm actually using the term in a very loose sense. Uh, actually, here what, what I'll probably be talking about, what I'll be talking about rather, is probably um, better described by the second term here, combinatorial explosion, and you should probably just group that as sparsity and cursive dimensionality together. Um, so yeah, I'm using this in a loose definition, but this is something that we've all encountered uh, doing machine learning, right? So whether it's be that you don't have enough data, or like we just saw, if a robot has lots of degrees of freedom or you're training a model and the gradient keeps blowing up um, or you, you know, certain issues pop up that you just never expected uh, because there's a very long tail of possible inputs. Uh, I kind of throw these into the same bucket and, and think of them in a similar way. One quick example, and I guess I'll, I'll just skim over this because it sounds like there's gonna be a talk after this that discusses more is hyperparameter settings, right? So um, when you're setting hyperparameters, hopefully you have a good starting point to go with where you can change uh, individual settings a bit and see how it does. Otherwise, even with a fairly short YAML file, there's a pretty large space to explore once you start tweaking optimization settings, learning rates, um, number of layers, uh, and so on. Uh, maybe something that is less obvious of uh, this type of combinatorial explosion problem is if we consider a five-step pipeline. So the task, uh, I just made up this task, but it's certainly something similar to things we encounter at Sampling. Uh, the task is spotting diagnoses in electronic health records. And uh, let's say the first try that we have is where there's a document, we extract certain sections that might be relevant, that might contain the information that we need. And after that is extracted, we tokenize it. Uh, we apply some simple filtering, maybe just removing stop words. And then finally, we have a classifier at the end that we train to classify uh, the tokens into the correct diagnostics. But the problem at the first pass is that we're seeing lots of high po false positives at the required recall that we need. Um, 
And so if you think, if you consider this pipeline, one thing that you might consider doing is adding an additional step. So maybe you see that a lot of the tokens that are erroneously classified as a particular disease are actually not even the correct part of speech. So you take your favorite part of speech tagger, you run that and you add a filter that will remove certain parts of speech before feeding everything into the classifier, right? And maybe this, maybe this helps, maybe this actually fix the, fixes things for you, um, but this is the type of thing that I think it's important to be very wary of. Um, why is this? Well, first of all, let's say later on you build a much better classifier, right? This step could bottleneck the performance of your system, um, especially if say, you know, the part of speech tagger is not really well tuned to the domain. Uh, another thing is, this is not too bad of a pipeline, but if, once you start tossing in additional steps, right, going from five to six to seven to eight steps in the pipeline, then there's just many more points where things can break down. Um, and so just from experiences, and, and of course, there's also the software debt you pay uh, in order to have all the different packages and, and make sure everything's on the right version. Um, and so from our experiences, even though this might be a, a band-aid that fixes things, it's something where you should stop and, and really consider uh, if you need something like this. Um, I purposefully made that example a little bit more, less controversial rather. Um, so the re more reasonable thing to do would probably be to just allow the classifier access to both the original filter tokens as well as part of speech tags, and then it can use the information that it needs. So if part of speech tag turns out to be useful, um, it should learn that. Otherwise, it can ignore it. Uh, but even something like this, uh, and I don't have a good justification for it, even something like this, uh, I feel a little bit queasy about putting that into a system. Uh, one other example, and this is a really old example. Uh, so it, and, and I don't think it, it relates much to some of the tech described in the previous talk, uh, but it's a robot pancake maker. Um, I'm not going to show the video. There is a video on YouTube uh, because, uh, you know, I'm going to mention some things that aren't entirely positive about it. But the idea was in 2011, there was a group that had a robot uh, make a pancake. So it would pour the batter. Um, it would cook the pancake in the pan. It would flip it onto a plate. And then it would take the plate and put it on a table. And... I remember in 2011 when I saw this video, uh, I was doing some robotics and I got super excited, right? Uh, I printed the paper and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna read this and learn so much. Um, and I mentioned this to someone more senior in the lab and I'll never forget, they, they just gave me this look and they said, you do realize everything in that demo was hard coded, right? Um, and at the time, that kind of you know, took the wind out of my sails. Uh, I still read the paper, but I certainly wasn't as excited about it. Um, but looking back uh, much later on, it's still pretty amazing that they got that demo to work. I mean, you can hard code stuff as much as you want, but there's still so many points at which the process can fail. Um, and you know, maybe what, what the demo did doesn't, improve generalization uh, or the performance of robots in unstructured environments. Um, but I still think it was a really impressive feat. And, uh, and one other fun thing too, if you see one of those videos, uh, look for someone in the background who looks like they haven't you know, showered or slept in a few days. <laughs> and that's probably the grad student who was hard coding stuff. Um, so, so going beyond pipelines and lots of steps, one, one thing you, you might think of doing is just looking at images, speech, and text. And you, you might say, well, a medium-sized 480p image, that's 300,000 pixels. And then if you look at an RGB image, that's three channels. So you end up with almost a million intake values, right? And you can do similar math for audio. So let's say it's 16 kilohertz, which is not very high resolution audio. Um, in 30 seconds, and you end up with about half a million in 16 values. And then you look at text, right? So a three sentence paragraph, let's say it's ASCII. So we can represent each character um, as a zero to 255 integer and maybe 50, 50 characters per sentence and you end up with 150 intake values.
And uh, you might, might look at this and say, hmm, those NLP folks have really been slacking. Um, the image, it, representing images and text just seems a lot more difficult. Um, and I've actually seen people who really should, or actually heard people who really should know better um, express that sentiment as well. You know, text is just a 1D sequence as opposed to uh, images, which can be 3D speech, which you can transform into these 2D images. And uh, there's also, of course, the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. But with text, uh, one example that I frequently refer to is if you just take this six word sentence here, Alice enjoyed her trip to Wonderland. This seems like a pretty reasonable sentence, right? Uh, outside of Wonderland, all these unigrams or tokens rather are ones that are frequently used. But if you search on the web for that phrase, it never appears. Right? So the data sparsity problem is really extreme for text as well. And I think there's just this notion of brittleness, which isn't well captured by the math that I showed earlier. So there was this tweet from Riza Zadeh where he talked about how there's tons of data augmentation strategies for computer vision, um, but there's not many for NLP and the data can be a lot more brittle. Uh, so, so obviously for images, you know, you can apply affine transforms, you can flip it, you can add Gaussian noise, similar, some similar things for audio as well. Um, there's this notion of manifolds where you can perturb an image off the image manifold and train the system to push it back. It's the entire idea behind noise and autoencoders. And that's something where the model can learn something, a meaningful encoding. Uh, but try doing something similar to text. And I think you'll find that it's very easily mangled. Um, and so this is a case where uh, I think very simple back of the envelopes really, really don't apply. And um, I, I really haven't seen that much research into this notion of brittleness. If anyone's seen any, I'd be very curious, uh, but this is just something to keep in mind. If you're doing data augmentation for text or, or you think it's a particular task uh, might be easy. So lessons from first section on cursive dimensionality. You can try some rough calculations, but keep in mind some complex entanglements. Um, I really do think you try and keep the system simple and try and push you know, different components and software complexity into the data and loss function if you can. Yes, this is me, perhaps just me being biased towards more end-to-end -end systems. Um, and yeah, I think there's actually many more uh, learnings that you can extract from just this notion of combinatorial explosion or cursive dimensionality. Like for example, if anyone's used Zapier, uh, it's this system like if this, then that, where you chain together different integrations. Um, I have some zaps and they break a surprising amount of time, amount of the time. And that's, that's not even chaining together machine learning systems, right? That's chaining together REST APIs. Um, you know, where, where are things like RPA headed? Um, yeah, lots more you could think about uh, for this topic. But let's move on to the second one, which is iteration time. So I don't think, you know, folks really need convincing that iteration time is really important. I think there was a talk by Jeff Dean a few years back where he described two extremes of the spectrum. One is where you can iterate in a matter of seconds to minutes. And he described this as nirvana, interactive coding. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, maybe training something takes months. And uh, I think he said, you know, don't even try it at, at that extreme. Uh, Joshua Bengio, and I'm not 100% sure he said this, but I believe at a deep learning summer school, he some, said something along the lines of, in the 90s, we trained models for weeks. If we had only trained them for months, we may have advanced the field by five to 10 years. So speeding up that flywheel or virtuous cycle or feedback loop is obviously really important. Um, one thing I don't think sees that much discussion though is which feedback loop should you focus on when? Uh, this figure here is one that I made when I was really frustrated. Um, and the, the setting is it's 2017 um, and we had been working on an NLP system that would correct or denoise text and we started off with 
a LSTM model, encoder decoder LSTM. And then, and I'm not sure if people remember this, these convolutional sequence to sequence models came out and got really excited, um, you know, thought, wow, this can really help us perhaps capture longer context. And we end up transferring our, I think it was Theano, LST, encoder decoder LSTM code into the convolutional sequence to sequence code. Um, and then, so we completed it, uh, performance, I don't think it improved that much, uh, but was still pretty excited. And then, you know, it turns out attention is all you need. Um, and at that point, I was just like, eh, yeah, I'm not gonna, I don't think we're gonna, you know, switch to this new architecture for a little bit. Um, and to be fair, you know, transformers have been ascendant for, I think, pretty much three years now, almost exactly three years. Um, so it might be the case that uh, the architecture, what, what I'm showing here isn't true anymore. Um, the, the idea is that architectures are changing. And so how much, if you have a fixed budget of time, how much do you want to spend on optimizing architectures versus focusing on other aspects? Um, one thing which I don't think perhaps people spend enough time on in, the, in their, or trying to improve the speed of is the coding, right? Because that's really fast. Um, it's a relatively unchanging procedure. So you might as well just get the most you can out of the decoding process and then switch back once you're sure you have a really, really good decoding procedure. Uh, what I left out here was, of course, data. Uh, you know, as an academic, you assume, most of the time, you assume you just have a data set. But of course, here, we should include data. Uh, and that's something where you should really make sure that you're getting the data that you need. Because of course, it could be weeks to months before to, that it'll take to collect that data. Um, another thing which I think is also under discussed is model update iteration time. So by this, I mean, you have a model, you deploy it. How frequently do you retrain and bring a new model online for people to use, right? Um, so one example that I saw recently was Instacart. They had a system for predicting the demand for certain products at stores. Um, and of course, with COVID, that model just went way off. And so they had to bring a new model online. That model would focus on a much shorter time window. Uh, I think it was, they reduced it from something like a month to a week. Um, but, but of course, it was necessary in this case. And then the, the horror story here, of course, is Microsoft Tay, where they, they put the model out, the chatbot model, the chatbot learned from people tweeting to it or, or chatting with it, and it picked up the worst of the internet. So, so that's kind of a, uh, a cautionary tale of this. So I, I, I just put two sentences here, measure, divergence, encourage, invariances. I, I really don't know what either of those sentences mean, um, but I think it's something that is a challenge. And when I tried finding some libraries or literature, um, there, wasn't, there wasn't that much out there. Uh, and so, again, it's something where um, I'd be curious if folks have thoughts, and I, I would also love to see more libraries pop up that help with this problem. One thing you can contrast this with is speed up time, iteration time, and by this I mean how long does it take to speed up a system? Um, and I should say that if you're at a company that makes more ad revenue than the GDP of, of certain countries, uh, or if you bought a lot of NVIDIA stock in 2015, uh, you can probably just ignore the, the content of the slide. I would too. Uh, but generally from what I've seen, speed of time, iteration time is pretty fast. Um, so in, in contrast to the previous model iteration, model update iteration time. Um, so, so why is this? Especially for research to production, you know, researchers, they, they don't have, they don't, they're not worried about the latency, right? They're worried about the performance on a certain benchmark. And so they'll go well past the point of diminishing returns oftentimes. So maybe the model's way bigger than it really needs to be, or maybe they're even using an ensemble of eight models. So right off the bat, you probably have five different ways in which you can reduce the size or the amount of compute needed for something by a factor of two. Um, so right off the bat, you probably have, can get like a 30x speed up without too much effort. 
And the other aspect is that this is well-defined, right? And I think this is actually the most important point. You have your system and you wanna make it go faster. Um, well, oftentimes you can just take your favorite profiler, go through, um, figure out what you need to focus on. And to be honest, generally I'll see that the, the hard parts, uh, which are, are perhaps the convolutional kernels, the matrix multiply kernels um, are, are done, right? Uh, and, and I'm certainly not saying that making matrix multiply kernels is, uh, is easy. I, I've tried it and wow, was I confused. Um, but, but beyond that other stuff that you're working on on top of it, I think it's, it's possible to profile and, and get good speed ups. Um, and yeah, if, if all else fails, you know, what you do is just deploy your solar system on AWS with GPU instances, watch your cache go bye-bye, and you'll figure out some way to speed things up. Um, one example I think is interesting, which ties together the first couple of sections is in Texas speech uh, in a paper called WaveNet. So this was 2016. Um, so the context is at the time, most deployed, uh, oh, sorry, I should say that this example, th there's so many other examples. You can find this in neural machine translation. You can find examples in, in object detection, I'm sure. Uh, but this is just one example that I thought was interesting for TTS. Um, so at the time, the dominant approach for deployed TTS systems was this so-called unit selection method. So you would have some text, say, PGNE will file schedules on April 20th. And this should be text analysis. You go through this text analysis step um, you, to perform some analysis of the prosody and, and other attributes. And then what would happen is um, short little snippets, units would be selected, and then they would be put together post-processed in order to generate the final waveform. This was how TTS systems worked. Uh, so if you think back to the first section on these, these complex pipelines, um, this is certainly one of them. And then in 2016, summer 2016, there was this WaveNet paper that where they still uh, have the first steps here. So they still would run some of this step, but instead of doing unit selection, what they did was they would condition on that information and then they would try and generate the waveform directly. Meaning if you have a 16 kilohertz waveform, you would generate 16,000 samples per second, uh, which seems kind of crazy, but it got it to work. Um, it achieved a mean opinion score that was much higher than other deployed systems. I think people are saying it probably advanced the field by five years. Um, and so this is, of course, just an example of how these end-to-end -end deep learning systems can, can help. Uh, but one criticism of the work when it came out was that it was really slow. So if you look at this, as you go along, you have to condition on more and more previous contexts in order to generate the next sample. And so it gets slower as you're generating these later samples. Um, I don't know the exact number, but I think it was at least 50x slower than real time. And so people were critical of this. Um, I, I think I was also like, eh. But looking back, you know, it, it may be slow, but if you think about the discussion of iteration time, it's still much faster than the amount of time they, they need to take to train the models. And you know what? I'm sure they, they thought that they could speed it up if they needed to. And sure enough, I think a year and a half later, it was deployed and a thousand X faster than the system that they described in this paper. Okay, so third topic, opaque models. Um, I have the, this comparison of, that tries to give a sense of the trade-offs with some of these deep learning models, which is really kind of what I mean when saying opaque models. So what we want is something that's interpretable, that's controllable, um, that's like a science, right? Maybe it'd be really nice if you could write a compact set of, of laws that describe how these systems behave. Unfortunately, that's not the case, but what we have is something that's really powerful and expressive. Um, but if you saw the NIPS talk a few years ago, but it can be described more like alchemy, right? Um, and so there's this cute little analogy here of knobs on a radio versus a kite, um, where maybe you can kind of guide it, but 
a lot of it is just up to the mercy of the winds. Um, so, so that's fine and all. I think this describes some of the characteristics of previous ML methods and deep neural nets, uh, but I don't really think it gives you a visceral sense of what we mean when we say these uh, opaque models. And so I have an incantation here to indoctrinate folks who perhaps don't really, don't completely buy in to the cult of opaque models. Um, here it is. We improved 3% on existing state of the art by training a bi-directional LSTM and stacking it on top of another bi-directional LSTM. <laughs> um, I know we had the example, Alice enjoyed her time in Wonderland where I was saying that it's quite unlikely for certain sentences to occur even at six tokens. Uh, but you know, there was some NLP researcher who basically said this verbatim in 2015 or 2016. I probably said this verbatim in 2015 and 2016. Uh, and on the one hand, it's pretty amazing that you have this level of abstraction in the sentence. But on the other hand, there's really, does anybody really know what's going on here um, when you say something like this? Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of gives you a more visceral sense of what we mean by these opaque or black box models. Um, yeah, and if you're really hardcore, you know, you can get the equations uh, tattooed as well. Uh, so one other view is, I, I saw this tweet recently from Kareem Carr, who I think is a statistician. Uh, he showed, posted this video and captioned it, how statistics people feel watching people in machine learning solve problems. Uh, so let me play that really quick. <laughs> uh, and, and when I saw this, video, uh, I started cracking up because uh, <laughs> it's so true. Like sometimes the methods we use for certain tasks can really feel like overkill. Um, one fun exercise actually, as you watch this video is you can try and associate cliffs with certain architectures, right? Like uh, uh, Perceptron, the net, Siamese net. Um, anyways, yeah. so. So what was the point I was trying to make here? Right, what's the goal though? If, if your world is just popping balloons and the entire reward function is how you can pop balloons in really exquisite ways, I, I think it's hard to argue against what this guy is doing. Um, but I think as an onlooker and taking a step back a little bit, um, it seems pretty dangerous. And so uh, I think beyond just, you know, this, this being overkill for certain tasks, I think it's also an, an apt analogy because sometimes it's, you should be a little bit cautious before deploying these models. So one case uh, that illustrates that is with what I think of as hard constraints and to, uh, to demonstrate this, I think it's useful to think about a couple of extremes. One is click-through rate. So say you're trying to improve the click-through of news articles or product listings. Um, and then the other is vehicle detection, presumably for autonomous vehicles. Uh, those two require very different approaches, right? So um, obviously for click-through rates, if somebody doesn't click a particular article, it's, it's okay. Uh, whereas on the other hand, if a vehicle isn't consistently detected, um, that, that can have fatal consequences. With these multi-armed bandit problems, there's an entire notion of exploration versus exploitation, right? Whereas for uh, vehicle detection, hopefully you're only doing that in simulation. Um, so I, I also include this link to a pretty useful introduction to different types of evaluation metrics. And I think it's important um, really important for research to production because say you have a trade-off curve, right? And you're optimizing to hit the corner of the trade-off curve. Uh, so say precision recall, and you really need really high precision, really high recall. Um, depending on how close you are to that corner, that makes a lot of decisions for you on things that you can and can't do given say the amount of data that you have. Um, so yeah, and this goes beyond training and validation, right? So one thing that I think it 
could also be discussed more is safeguards. Um, so say you've built a really nice text generation system and you want to deploy it. Uh, and sometimes the system will generate profanity because the training data had profanity. Um, so you want a profanity filter. I, I looked for a profanity filter a couple years back and let's just say there's no hugging face for profanity filtering. Maybe there is now, at the time there certainly wasn't. Um, and I don't think you want to build this amazing text generation system and then build a really crummy, you know, thrown together profanity filter at the end. Um, another thing which I think is useful to do in these cases is a different sort of validation set, not necessarily adversarial data um, where you have some attack vector, but let's say data that users may input in, in a perfectly normal interaction with your system, uh, but that ends up causing really pathological behaviors. I think that is actually really interesting and, and it can be sometimes really hard to figure out as well. Um, and of course, monitoring on updates. But really, I think just this slide, uh, what I'm trying to get across is there's a depth and rigor toward that, it, that there exists for training models, validating models that really doesn't exist, I think, when you're trying to um, deploy these models and put them out into the wild, if you will. With bias and fairness as well, uh, I saw this tweet recently from Hannah Wallach that describes something similar. So one of her students, Su Lin, surveyed 146 papers looking at bias in NLP systems. Um, and they had a few conclusion and recommendations among those that people in the papers tend to just focus on NLP literature. They don't really go outside of the literature um, to say literature talking about social hierarchies. They all describe some metric regarding bias uh, and then just say that it's good to lower that metric without really thinking about the downstream effects. And I, I think the third point they made was just seeing more research going from research to application. Um, and so here, there's a certain amount of looking at the downstream effects and applying rigor to, to the process uh, that I think there needs to be more of. Uh, but assuming you, know, you build a system and you think that the constraints, it, the constraints that you have make sense, um, you set up safeguards and you think about the downstream effects and you still want to deploy it, uh, there, there can still be funny little behaviors. So this is a, an old result from a while ago of Google neural, Google's neural machine translation system where a user typed egu, egu, egu over and over. And because the system has never seen this type of input before, it would just generate this crazy, hallucinate this crazy gibberish. Um, and there was this article from Douglas Hofstadter, the author of Godel Asher Bach, where he, he described these systems. And he used just the perfect word to describe this behavior, um, which is that it wobbles. Uh, so the user inputs egu, 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 the model goes wobble, 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 and you end up with this type of behavior. So I, I think Google's neural machine translation team published a post recently talking about how they improve things across the board, including with these hallucinations, uh, but still something to look out for. Um, you know, I don't know what you feel when you read a paper that describes an amazing result. That, that's almost like an existence proof. You didn't, you weren't quite sure if it was even possible before. Um, or the sensation you get when you deploy a system or see a deep learning system deployed and, and you can tell it's one uh, just by the strange ways in which it misbehaves. Um, but to me, it feels like I'm watching something like this. It's it's really such a thrill. Um, and I think that if you think about how to iterate quickly, um, think about the trade-offs of these really opaque models uh, and also factor in the ways in which different factors of the problem can compound in strange ways. Um, you'll, if you haven't, you'll, you'll deploy one of these systems or, or deploy more of these systems and there's a good chance that it'll work better than anything else that anyone's ever deployed. Um, that's it. Thanks. Nice. Thank you so much.
Uh, all right, let's do questions. I see some popping up already. Oh my God, Hans got a three-parter. Uh, let's dive in. So the first question is, what data annotation tool do you prefer for annotating text uh, data for say um, NER or multi-ring uh, classification? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Data is obviously really critical. Um, so I have to admit with us, due to budgetary constraints, we, we would love to be able to annotate data, but generally we will try and figure out data augmentation schemes uh, based off of the existing data that we already have. I know there's great annotation systems out there. I'm sure you know, there's figure eight uh, with Lucas, of course, uh, but, and I think, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Prodigy, there was, there was some system, other system out there, um, but I'm, I'm not really not familiar with them. Yeah. Wait, you mentioned data augmentation. Uh, what kinds of data augmentation methodologies are you using? Sure, yeah. So for text in particular, as I mentioned, the naive methods can sometimes really mangle the text or change the meaning. So uh, I think the most obvious thing people try is you will drop certain words um, or you will swap them or insert additional words. It could be at the character level as well. Uh, and, and the crazy thing is this has actually worked well for all these different pre-training methods. I didn't see that coming. Uh, but for us, what we found actually worked was actually this method called back translation where you take your existing parallel corpus. So say you have a corpus from English to French, and then you will take additional monolingual French data, a train a reverse system, and use your system to actually translate it back to English. And then you have additional half synthesized parallel data. So back translation uh, is really useful. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, awesome. The second question from Han is, what do you recommend as a metric or algorithm to monitor input data, uh, to ma uh, monitor input data drift for uh, NLP? Yeah, um, input data drifts. So yeah, I have the slide on monitoring. Uh, we have certain quality metrics at the end where we look at how often users will accept suggestions that we make. Unfortunately, I don't have any great method to share for measuring the input drift. I, I know that there's the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is something like just looking at comparing the bag of words, bag of unigrams and bigrams. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a great suggestion Bye. there. Nice. And then uh, Hans' third question is, uh, what's a good alternate uh, way to speed up text generation uh, in addition to feeding AWS a lot of money or uh, reduce beam search sampling size? Yeah, uh, so, so those are both good ways. Uh, reducing beam search, you can, if people haven't tried, you can run with very low beam search and usually get very good results. Um, other ways, Distillation is one method. Quantization, if you can, that, that, may, that may prevent you from using your favorite framework. Uh, and then just also making sure that you're using the best libraries. Uh, if you're running on CPU, things like it's called SIMD or, or AVX. Um, if you're running on GPU, there's all those CUDA libraries as well. Cool. Uh, Charles, did you have a question? Because there's some on YouTube as well. Yeah. Um, one thing, I'm just going to drop this in the chat. Uh, just for natural language processing data augmentation, there was a nice presentation at one of our previous salons by Jack Morris uh, on uh, their text attack uh, library. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like the things you were describing, word substitution based off of like uh, word vector similarity and um, like and synonym uh, like thesauruses. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's nowhere near as good as the perturbations and translations that we can apply to images and audio. Uh, but it is a step in that direction. And it's a nice, uh, it's a nice package. I took, took, took a look at it after uh, they're talking, it was uh, very good. So might be worth uh, checking out. Um, but I wanted to pull in actually one of the questions from YouTube. Uh, so 
uh, do you do any work with um, audio natural language processing or is it primarily text? Ah, uh, um, so by audio natural language processing, do they mean going from speech to text or, or processing the audio in another way? Uh, yeah, I mean, their question is about vernaculars and accents. Um, oh, gotcha. So, uh, so my presumption is that it that this you know you need an audio in order to have uh, an accent, right? So I'm right. just so do you work with natural language processing that uses all, like recordings of natural language to do some downstream NLP tasks? Right. Uh, so we do not, um, but I know Auni Hanun, uh, A W N I H A N N U N, wrote a post maybe a year or two ago about some of the phenomena with speech and accents. Um, he had this great post about remaining challenges in speech recognition now that we have these speech systems trained on a ton of data. Mm -hmm. so, so that might be helpful, um, but yeah, we don't work with that type of data. Cool, yeah, thanks. I thought found that question particularly interesting because I was reading some papers earlier this week about how court transcription done by humans actually just the quality of the transcriptions when applied to African-American vernacular English is substantially worse than to prestige dialects of English. Uh, and right. this is the kind of thing we'd like to be able to maybe use machine learning to like automate OA biases, but contemporary methods can suffer from the same uh, biases that uh, humans do. Yeah, uh, de definitely. Um, and I think that is something where Perhaps we, we don't have the right data right now, but it is um, a nice part of the, about the ML system as well is that if we can get that, it can adapt uh, to it. So. Uh, Salim asks, would you tell us more about sapling and also your transition from uh, being a PhD student to the industry? Yeah, sure. So sapling, um, sapling.ai, you can check out the website. We have this animated screenshot that, that shows a few of the different features from autocomplete to uh, correcting the text to suggesting replies in chat. Uh, but regarding going from PhD to this, uh, actually started working on some aspects of this uh, while before I had finished. Um, and there, there's advantages to that, but I, I personally would not recommend it because it can also cause some misalignments. So if you are thinking of doing a PhD, but you're interested in a startup as well, uh, I, would, I would talk to some people who have done that. And I imagine the suggestion you all get is finish your PhD, take a break, and then uh, get back to startup stuff if you're interested in it, so. You were doing both at the same time? That's nuts. Yeah. I tr yeah, if you can call it that, yeah. Interesting. So. Which one suffered? I'm curious. The startup or the PhD? Oh, I'm sure both suffered yeah, early on. <laughs> yeah. uh, so someone on YouTube uh, asks, uh, this is a slightly longer question. Uh, so they're a linguistic uh, major, uh, then undergrad, and they're in their senior year. And they've been doing phonology research, which has given them insight into formal language theory and applications to natural language. And they were wondering if they went to grad school to study uh, just linguistics, uh, would they be hireable for NLP jobs? Um, if so, if, what should they leverage in their current uh, program uh, to be competitive for NLP jobs? Yeah, so one of my uh, advisors was Dan, Dan Drasky, um, I think he's, he's in the CS and linguistics department. I'm guessing his heart is really in, more on the linguistics side of things, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think linguistics right now, there's, there's so much going on in computational linguistics. And um, I wish I had learned more during grad school, actually. Uh, but I feel now more than ever, there's, there's lots of overlap there. Um, and I think you can do really cool stuff as well that that isn't just a, a function of amount of data and, and model size. Uh, so, so it may also be a good time. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's really interesting. And if you do cool work, I don't see why it would bottleneck you. Thanks. They also asked, are you looking for an intern? 
Oh, sapling. Uh, we currently are not. Uh, we wish we were positioned where we were, but currently no, sadly. Um, so as somebody who also went from, uh, very recently, from academia to industry, I found the point that you made about uh, how a lot of academic work is obsessed with things that bring very diminishing returns. So this sort of like soda fetish that people have, um, uh, which is also reflected in Kaggle where there's these like giant ensemble models that get just like a tiny fraction of additional performance on some test set. So I'm wondering what, kind, like you're out of academia now, but do you have any thoughts about what kind of culture shift might be necessary? What changes and in incentives uh, could make it so that people do research that would be more helpful for people working in applications um, in industry? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And um, yeah, I, I haven't, I, I don't think I have that great a feel for, for what's best to do here, but I do think that there have been some interesting initiatives here, like for example, uh, folks trying to push for how well you can perform um, on a certain budget. I think that the, the interest in leaderboards and the amount of compute as well has been largely driven by uh, industry with lots of budget who, who are trying to compete on these for develop the, perhaps for the brand of a particular lab. Um, but yeah, like I, I think like you said, folks are realizing that there needs to be broader range of work. Um, and if you're in academia, it may make sense to focus on um, perhaps more fundamental aspects of, of machine learning, of deep learning, as opposed to competing with lead on leaderboards. But uh, I'm sure I'll continue and I really don't have a great suggestion. Yeah, that's fair. It's a, a tough, tough question, definitely. Um, and yeah, maybe the, the scale of the problem is exemplified actually by the point you made about, uh, you know, Yashua Benji was saying that if only they'd been training for months in the nineties, they would have advanced like five or 10 years faster. Mm -hmm. um, like the people working on neural networks in the nineties were getting the pants beat off of them by, you know, SVMs, Gaussian process models, like, you know, sophisticated approaches to linear and logistic regression. Um, but it was only this sort of like fundamental, you know, this fundamental shift that was able to get us to where we are today. And it's really hard to figure out how to incentivize that. Yeah. Do, do you have some additional thoughts there about how to incentivize that behavior? Uh, you thought about it. <laughs> I I got a I got a lot of thoughts. Not all of them, <laughs> you know, uh, suitable for recording. But I would say number one is increasing resources to academia to allow people to like get out of the like short feedback loop of having to publish in order to get grants in order to publish. Um, if people were uh, less squeezed, they could think a little bit longer term, but yeah. All right, thank you, Sang. Uh, that was really good. Thank you. Uh, see ya. All right, up next, uh, we have Stacy. Uh, like Luca said, Stacy uh, works at Weights and Dice. So she's um, our only deep learning engineer now, and she's amazing. Uh, today, she's going to talk about how to do hyperparameter tuning with uh, sweeps. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. Thanks, Alanya. I'm going to uh, figure out how to project here. One sec. Um, can folks see? Um, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Stacy. I'm a deep learning engineer here at Weights and Biases. Um, and I'm here to talk about how to tune your deep learning models faster. Um, I won't get into much theory or math behind different algorithms for hyperparameter optimization. Um, you know, like what's guaranteed to converge faster, what kind of model-based optimization you should use. Um, and I'm not going to tell you the best hyperparameters to pick for a given problem, um, because the space just varies so much. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on what I've learned from uh, reproducing and fine tuning a bunch of different models over the last two years. Uh, in my setup, I'm often forking some code for an existing model from GitHub, um, instrumenting it with logging and visualizations, 
and then trying to improve the performance um, or at least report some interesting analysis of what I learned uh, generally as fast as I can. And I do that so I can showcase more examples of machine learning on our platform, um, but also be able to say something interesting and, and helpful each time. Um, and in that process, I've learned a lot about the explore exploit trade off, which um, interestingly came up in the previous talk. That was cool. Um, yeah, and I'll show lots of screenshots from weights and biases, uh, because that's where I track all my experiments. Uh, but the general approach and tips should work in any developer environment and hopefully with any framework. I'm also giving this talk uh, tomorrow and it's supposed to not be a product pitch. So I really appreciate any feedback and um, generally aiming to have it be not too weights and biases specific, even though obviously I'm very excited about weights and biases. Um, if you haven't heard about the explore exploit trade-off before, um, it's a useful handle for many life situations. Um, it comes from the multi-armed bandit problem where uh, classically you're in a casino uh, and all the slot machines have a different um, unknown and probably really tiny probability of paying out money. So how do you maximize your winnings? You could go try a bunch of machines and this explore strategy, or you could pick one and play it over and over and uh, hope that you picked a really good one. That's the exploit strategy. Um, I'm not super into the casino metaphor, but I think it does uh, bring out a darker side of the process um, that's similar across um, both of these things, um, which is that uh, it's hard to, hard to stop. Um, you know, that's it, I can't lose any more money, or um, this is as good as this model gets. I don't know about that last 0.05%. Um, it's hard to tell uh, what's really happening uh, versus how you're feeling about it, the story you're telling yourself. So for example, I might have just lost 20 times in a row um, and I might be thinking I'm doing great. I'm having a lot of fun, this is awesome. Or you know, I might be thinking, oh, this is awful. This is the worst. This accuracy is never gonna get above 70%. Um, you know, I give up. Um, as often happens, I think the story uh, and what you experience is more important. You know, what are you getting out of the process? Um, what can you do better next time? And so I'm going to tell a few stories of how I've encountered this, and they definitely won't point you to the best uh, hyperparameter slot machine, uh, but hopefully you'll be able to tune your models faster next time, or at least avoid repeating my mistakes by thinking about the constraints for each hyperparameter sweep. Um, making sure you write down what you found from the sweep and what to do next time, and then improving that way over time. So um, what is hyperparameter tuning? Um, hyperparameter tuning or optimization is the task of finding the best hyperparameters for a learning algorithm, which for the purposes of this talk, it's going to be a convolutional or a recurrent neural network. Um, GANs and reinforcement learning could probably take their whole own separate talk on how to tune those. Um, and this tuning could be done entirely by hand, um, one experiment at a time, one hyperparameter at a time, but of course that would be super slow and we really like going meta. And so we'll go meta on this manual practice of trying hyperparameters and use algorithms. Um, there's a lot of research and different tools, um, both paid and open source for this algorithmic or automated aspect of hyperparameter tuning. And basically we're trying to figure out how to save time and uh, pick optimally pick the next combination of hyperparameters each time. Um, and the most common methods uh, you know, are manual, which I described, you just do it. Um, grid, which tries all possible combinations. Um, and that's useful if your search space is small and specific and you wanna guarantee finding the best combination. Um, random search is generally faster and especially recommended if you have uh, a larger search space because it's gonna sample more of the space and give you a sense for various possibilities faster than grid search, uh, but it's not guaranteed to find the best combination. Uh, Bayesian optimization tries to build a probabilistic model or guess at the function that maps from your hyperparameters to your target measure of your performance, which is usually accuracy on the validation set. Uh, and this Bayesian model of your actual model that you're training updates from every experiment. So we tried these hyperparameters, got this result, and it actually aims to balance the explore exploit trade off um, such that it tries um, you know, values that it needs to learn about to explore the space and also tries ones that it expects to be near optimal and gets you closer to the objective. Um, in practice, this works faster than grid and random because it runs you know, fewer bad experiments. 
Uh, one caveat though is that it needs uh, a metric to optimize. So you would need to know what that is and compute that explicitly. If you're just playing around initially, a random or grid search might be pretty good. Um, and there's a long tail of other methods that I'm not gonna get into. Um, you can actually do gradient-based optimization with respect to specific hyperparameters. Um, you can do early stopping so that you detect earlier if a certain run is not promising and don't waste compute on it. Um, you can do uh, population-based training where actually uh, you have multiple independent processes that learn both hyperparameter values and network weights. Um, so you don't even need to be using the same architecture for different processes in your sweep. So um, there are many, many options here. And uh, what I like to ask myself is, am I at that stage where I've thought through the specific model that I'm tuning and the specific problem that I'm solving and um, there's nothing else clever I can do I just want to throw GPUs at this hyperparameter sweep and get my answer and go think about something else. And I think if that's the case, I would suggest just using something that's model-based optimized, like a Bayesian sweep, because um, it's probably going to work much faster. Um, but I also think the more interesting and challenging and rewarding work of hyperparameter tuning happens before you get to that stage where you just want to throw a compute at it. And uh, we really don't have good guaranteed algorithms for it yet. Uh, which is why many of us still have jobs. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to talk about. And obviously, as we go through this, please keep in mind that these are like general approaches. Um, and your particular task might be different. And especially in machine learning, there's exceptions to every rule. So um, right, uh, before you start trying different hyperparameters, uh, you decide what a hyperparameter even is. And there's an important distinction between you know, the regular parameters of the network like the model weights and biases, which are learned or iteratively improved during the training process, um, and the hyperparameters, which are configured outside of the training process. And generally, they're fixed for the duration of your run, um, although some could be adaptive, like learning rate. Um, so for a given network, this could be you know, the number of training epochs, learning optimizer type, batch size, weight decay, and a lot of other stuff. Um, the network architecture itself, you could think of that as a hyperparameter. You could start from a well-known base network like Inception or ResNet. Um, you know, you could tune a certain number of layers, freeze some, tune some variable other number. Um, and if you're designing a network from scratch, then the number and size and type and connection patterns and all of that could all be hyperparameters. Um, so one useful way to think about whether you're going to fix a hyperparameter uh, and keep it constant, or you're going to vary and explore it, is um, how well you can predict its effect in advance and how it will affect the overall runtime for your suite. So a first easy one here is epochs, uh, or the number of passes through your training data. And this one's pretty well understood. Um, if I'm running repeated experiments, I want to set this high enough so that I can see that my model's learning and there's definite improvement but not so high that I'm wasting time on a very slowly converging curve. So usually I'll try something like 10, if I can get away with it, um, as long as I see some improvement in validation loss um, and make sure that I'm not memorizing the data. Um, I like to set this to the minimum to see improvement. Another obvious hyperparameter that generally has a reliable effect is the size of your training data. Um, if you have a representative sample and your split is unbiased, you know, then generally the more training data you have, the better the model will learn. Um, I follow the conventional wisdom of, you know, 80 for train, 10 for validation and 10 for test. Um, those are percentages. And you don't look at the 10% that's for testing until, you know, you're done with the whole optimization process. Um, and I actually lower these for um, a run, an experiment in a sweep. I uh, take about 20 to 50% of each sweep as stand, uh, sorry, of each split. Um, and often I'm, I'm testing my code end to end on a very small subset anyways of the training data to make sure that it works. Um, and usually I try to do this to get the runtime down um, to a few minutes. Though of course that can be impossible in some applications. Um, and of course, a general caveat here that all of these things interrelate, especially with all of the other uh, hyperparameters that I'm going to try to vary. Um, after I set up one experiment or run, uh, I can scale those to a sweep or a set of experiments. And after a phase of that, I can test with the full data set, the full training data, 
and hopefully see that the observed patterns hold and maybe even improve uh, because I'm adding more data. And if adding more data doesn't help or makes the results worse, then I might be overfitting. Um, validation data can be especially tricky to fix here um, because the smaller sample that I'm taking might be too noisy or not representative. I'll get to a very concrete example of that later. Uh, one solution is to pick the validation set randomly each time and then just know that if anything, you're solving a harder problem. Uh, but you need to remember to keep validating the overall robustness of your solution on the full validation set after you're done with the sweep. And um, here I have a graphic of uh, my favorite, most obvious parallel coordinates chart. Um, because generally, as we're exploring these relationships between hyperparameters, we want to see like a really nice, clean relationship. You know, as, as you increase learning rate, validation accuracy really um, just increases. And this is some data that I ran on the economic indicators of um, like 140 countries, I think, uh, correlated with um, their country's uh, survey results on happiness. And um, it just shows a really clear effect that the more economic activity, the more happiness, um, but I'm excited to dig into this data. And um, in my experience, this is not what most of my hyperparameter um, plots look like for real machine learning data. Um, so now that we've set up this, a, a good framework, an iterative sweep, um, this is a repeated phase of tuning uh, or exploring with your sweep and then testing on the full training and validation set. Um, a good general strategy, especially when you're pressed for time, like I generally am, is to uh, start with a simple architecture or whatever's given in the code that you're looking at, um, or you know the, the most applicable state of the art. And then after manually testing a few runs, just to get a sense of different train validation sizes and epochs, and maybe a few other hyperparameters that you want to fix, you can set up a first exploratory sweep. Um, I would recommend only changing a few hyperparameters at a time and um, sampling only a few values in each one, uh, but going for a wider range per hyperparameter, uh, because even if those fail, you'll get a better sense of the search space faster. Uh, for example, I would try several orders of magnitude for learning rate, um, and I wouldn't get into very fancy specifics at this point. Um, I find that the training dynamics are, are make for easier candidates to uh, explore first. So um, looking at how slow or fast your network learns for different learning rates and batch sizes uh, is going to be a little bit more effective because getting the right order of magnitude for something like learning rate, you know, if it's 0.01 versus 0.0001, um, is going to be more impactful than, you know, getting if it's 0.001 or 0.0015. Um, and same with batch size, you can See if it's closer to 16 or 128, but not exactly if it's 10 or 20, that will um, help you more and you don't need to get the number exactly right, right away. Um, I have optimizer and parens because that's gonna be highly correlated with your learning rate. Um, but in my experience, it can also have a huge effect on convergence. For example, Adam is generally great for most things, but I have seen projects where SGD just outperforms it massively. So I'm just an encouragement to consider exploring that as well. Um, so knowing that none of these are fully independent, um, I would then look at some of the fancier details. So the number of shape and shape of filters, um, your layer configuration. And when you're looking at layer configuration, I would not, I would again, not get too detailed because if you make too many changes or try too many detailed hypotheses in one sweep, um, you're looking at an explosion of possible uh, cases that you need to test. So as an example, you could construct, you know, a few different versions of your architecture, let's say a regular RNN and a bidirectional RNN, or you could make a CNN with max pooling versus average pooling and use those as categorical variables. Um, dropout can also be good to test. I have it lower in the list because um, I, uh, I found that if I increase it too early in my exploration process, then a good fraction of my runs just doesn't learn anything. So I would only increase it if you're already seeing some good results. And then the details go on, of course, weight decay, learning rate schedule, um, training stages, number of layers to freeze, uh, and so on. Um, my TLDR advice here is 
but I would try to stick with a simpler sweep than you might want at first and see what you learn. And um, how do you see what you learn? Um, I'm definitely uh, someone who obsessively refreshes my terminal output to see the ticking numbers um, as my Ferris callback logs. Um, weights and biases, of course, makes this much more pleasant and then I can watch a real-time plot instead. Um, but I still uh, think, you know, if you can in this stage, once you've debugged your code and you know that your sweep is running, um, let the algorithm just do the work for you. Um, because explicitly, you're not conditioning your experiment B on the output of experiment A. You're just letting the automatic hyperparameter tuning work for you. Um, and at this point, it's useful to set uh, some sort of constraint. So either the number of runs or the amount of time that you're gonna let this sweep explore. Um, you can um, also as kind of a worst case uh, metric use, um, you know, if it's already been running twice as long as the time at which you got your best result, then that's just my heuristic for like, it's unlikely to keep getting better results. And of course this might depend on the complexity of the sweep that you generated. Um, a really important part here is to um, look at your results once you're done and uh, write down what you're concluding and what you're gonna test next because it's very tempting to skip this step or think that you will remember or feel like there's some intuitive connection between learning rate and um, you know, validation accuracy that you're picking up on. Um, and I think the more concrete you can get with that, the better. Rates and biases also makes it easy to select specific runs to seed future sweeps with. And uh, from there, you can say increase the range that you're sampling, you can increase the precision. So try to get to a better value, you know, here, we're no longer just testing orders of magnitude, but maybe there's a significant difference between, you know, 60 filters and 65 filters. Um, uh, you can obviously add new hyperparameters here, and you can decide that, you know, you've tried enough values for this one and convert it to a constant in your code, in which case I would just write down why, um, why that was a good idea. So um, at this point, let's hop into some examples. Um, the first one here I have is from Drought Watch, which I talked about last time. This is a project to identify um, drought conditions from satellite images based on expert labels that we have from the ground. And um, here's just an example sweep the way that I would frame it in weights and biases. It's using Bayesian optimization to maximize validation accuracy. The ranges are pretty small and they're all in the um, sizes of the layers, but I'm keeping the architecture fixed and there's some dropout as well. And for this one, I actually ran only 50 runs. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a proof of concept. I like to name all my uh, runs with um, the variables that I'm testing so that I can easily read it off from the chart always. Um, this is like an extra wrapper that I, I do. Maybe at some point it'll make it into the core feature. Um, this is the... Uh, hyperparameter um, parallel coordinates chart that you can interactively explore to uh, show the correlations. I think I'm just gonna keep going here. Um, one, one thing that's interesting about this um, example is that here you can see that the dropout, um, the dropout actually has an, ex an extremely important and high correlation with um, the accuracy and um, that that like goes counter to the intuition I was building up before. And um, is this, did it switch to a new tab successfully? I'm gonna see if I can show the yeah. zoom. Are yeah, we, can see the, we can oh, see that? Okay, it's... awesome, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna show real quick how awesome it is to zoom into one of these regions, hopefully. Sometimes it slows down when I'm, uh, sharing a tab. Yeah, and then from here, you can see, you know, what are the parameters that correspond to um, my best runs. And it seems like if I just select, you know, the very top ones, then that does correspond to kind of surprisingly high dropout values. Um, but I think because this is running on a very small uh, data set sample, uh, it might, it might actually help. Um, so Going back, 
Um, I'm gonna hop into a different case study. Um, in this case, it's more of a fine tuning. And in this one, I'll talk about a fairly um, new shared project that I'm working on, which is deep form. And the goal is to extract um, structured information from receipts that look like this. Um, this is a, a receipt for a television advertisement. And we wanna be able to tell the name of the organization that paid for the ad, the dates that the ad ran, and so forth. Um, and this is easy for a human, but hard to do for a computer, especially from, uh, sorry, just, um, just the text, unless you incorporate geometric information and we're not quite at that stage yet. Um, so uh, what I did here was set up um, a pretty big sweep across a lot of um, parameters. And you can see here that um, a bunch of my values actually yielded NANDs. Um, and this is because um, the highest correlation found from my sweep is this distractors um, field. And that's when I'm training, I'm looking at one positive example of um, a correct answer for a receipt and then you know the text of the receipt. And the distractors are that for each correct match, I create one or more fake matches by picking a false label from the known set. And it turns out that if I trained in a balanced way, then the accuracy you know, levels out pretty quickly. But the more distractors I put in, the better the accuracy gets. So that's this really high correlation. Um, but um, the more distractors I put in, the bigger my data set gets in memory. And so it turned out that a bunch of my runs were actually failing for precisely the highest values of the distractors, which you can see here, the gray lines all correspond to the higher distractor values for the most part. Um, and in this case, you know, I let my sweep ran, run a really long time, even though it found the best values like pretty early on. And then I, I let it run for another few hours, I think after that. Um, so this is just a reminder to like sanity check, uh, how some of your range exploration might be affected by the way you set up your training code. And in this case, the best performance from the sweep was actually like pretty comparable to my best um, manual run. Um, and then a bit of both. Briefly, I have this project uh, to semantically segment street scenes, um, you know, identify each pixel as belonging to a car or a road or a human. Um, and uh, one thing I found here was that um, initially this project was using accuracy to measure performance and accuracy is not a really great metric um, because it only treats uh, an exact match as correct. And once I switched to intersection over union, um, I started seeing much better results. And this sweep, um, actually you can see this blue line connecting all the best results so far. Um, this sweep improved the performance pretty well. And it was helpful to see that, you know, learning rate had the highest correlation um, in the negative direction. So lower, lowering learning rate would have helped. Um, but an interesting aspect is that, um, I was specifically interested in my performance on humans, less so than like cars and uh, traffic signs and roads because it was already doing really well on those. And um, found from the sweep that uh, AlexNet was the best for humans, um, but it was actually less precise overall. And the reason it's best on humans is because it detects them as these kind of blocky figures, which you can see here. So it gets a high intersection over union uh, for kind of the wrong reasons. It just guesses at a much larger region than it needs to instead of precisely uh, finding them. And, it, and here, this is the raw photo, the prediction in the second column, and then the ground truth. So this just gives you a sense for, you know, the overall performance is pretty good and gets some of the details wrong. Um, but yeah, this is a case where optimizing for one thing, say human IOU, is might be separate from optimizing for, you know, overall IOU, and that might inform your decision in different sweeps. Um, yeah, so this is just zooming into a parallel coordinates plot. You can see here that um, AlexNet has pretty much all the worst performing runs, whereas ResNet 18 and ResNet 34 do better on average, even though for humans it's different. Um, yeah, so just to summarize, um, 
general advice from uh, fine tuning lots and lots of different models and different applications. Um, I find it really helpful to have one script that I can run manually with a specific configuration and also run in a sweep. Um, the shorter the run, the shorter your sweeps, the faster your feedback loop, the better. Um, I would bias towards exploring first and then exploiting later, especially for um, cases like that, um, that deep form project that I showed. I got this model to 95% uh, accuracy and was really proud of it the other week. And then, you know, Google published a paper like the next day or that week that um, uses a different, much better approach and has like a much more detailed architecture. And like the correct thing to do is definitely stop optimizing that model and to switch to the Google way. Um, so yeah, that's just to say don't exploit too much because the landscape is changing so quickly. Um, but also don't explore too much at once because if you you know try to put in a hundred hyperparameters and test a bunch of values for those, you're going to be running your sweep for days and you're not going to be able to uh, do the meta learning part on how to do a better sweep next time. And a lot of those choices might be a depth first tree and that they will determine how you structure the last the rest of your progress. Um, so I would not get too attached to any particular aspect of the model as you go. Um, and of course, your, um, your mileage on all of this may vary. As a last note here, I have um, just uh, two comparisons of a parallel coordinates plot. Um, the one on the top is showing actual signal and the one below is showing noise. And this is useful to think about um, when you're looking at you know, how much your performance improves with any particular change. Um, in this case, I found that in the noise case where all I varied was my random seed, my um, output metric varied by about 0.9%. And um, if I actually meaningfully varied hyperparameters, my output metric varied by uh, about 3%. So that's not, um, that's not an order of magnitude difference. That's like a 3x difference. And that's useful to remember when, um, especially for me when I'm like tracking these runs with such detail, hoping that they'll get just a little better at solving a particular problem. And yeah, um, I think that's it. Nice. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so maybe I'll ask that while other people can start popping their questions in the Q&A. And also the YouTube people can pop it in the chat. Uh, so. Uh, people always talk about base grid and random do you have uh like for the people who are just starting out do you have yeah. recommendations on which they should start with when to use which one yeah uh totally that's a great uh question and i i think i like tried to slip that in there but basically um grid is going to try all possible combinations so you want that one if you like really want to try everything and you want to be sure you got the best one um, random is what I would recommend if you're just exploring and you want to try a bunch of different stuff. Um, but you do have to keep in mind that it's like random and you might not um, find the best solution. And then I think Bayes um, overall does perform better and it's worth trying unless for some reason you don't have a metric that you're specifying. Like, like on average, you can expect Bayes to do better. Um, so yeah, the only reason not to try it would be if you don't know what you want to uh, what your goal is. Thanks. Uh, someone uh, on YouTube said, uh, in terms of it not, not sounding like a product pitch, you nailed it, which I'm oh. happy about. Yes. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> what, are, what are your uh, tips for amateurs uh, that want to perform sweeps but don't have the compute? That's a good question. Yeah. Oh, man. That's a good question. Um, so that's definitely a caveat that I did not, you know, super highlight. I, you know, have a machine on which I can use the GPU. Um, I mean, Colab is a great resource. Um, so ways that you can get access to a bit more compute. I think, you know, if you um, try a few experiments manually first, then you can really reduce the search space. And you know, in practice, I often do more manual exploration initially. Um, definitely early stopping would be helpful if you um, are concerned about compute. Um, and another nice thing about at least weights and biases sweeps is that they're easy to parallelize. So if you can get access to like eight GPUs for an hour, then you can just have them all run the same sweep and they will coordinate which things to try. And that's pretty 
pretty beautiful. Nice. Uh, also, one thing that I've even seen uh, our authors, we have an author's program, so they struggle with this too. Like, when do you switch from manual to um, a very, a sweep, you know, that's very structured? Because what if you don't even know what hyperparameters to track in the beginning and you're still trying to explore? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so it's, it's definitely like a judgment call. Um, mm -hmm. I would, um, or what I've done in the past is if I, um, if I can't see reliable improvement, that's, that's one thing. If I, mm -hmm. um, feel like I've like tried all my hypotheses that were easy to determine with one experiment and I'm kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm, I'm done. Like just, just run this on a GPU and you tell me. I think it's also useful to um, like, I think people tend to think of hyperparameter optimization because of like optimization as the thing that happens at the end. Like you've done most of the work and you're at 90% and now you wanna get to like 92. Um, but I think especially if you set a large range, then it can still be useful from the like, you know, 50% or like random baseline to 75% just by telling you like, Hey, actually, like you should try a much larger learning rate. Or um, it turns out the distractors are like the most useful, and you just could keep increasing that. Nice, cool. Uh, Charles, do you have one? Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I wanted to like plus one your statement about using collab. I think like getting up the like modifying your tooling so that it works well with collab is well worth the extra compute that it can bring you. Um, and that secondly, if you want to try and increase your ability to do hyperparameter tuning, you can learn a lot of sort of things that you were mentioning, like lower learning rate or higher learning rate or use distractors, use more or less data augmentation, more or less dropout. You can learn that in smaller networks often. And a lot of those things will translate. So I think it's a good idea to, to um, like, to work, yeah, with a tight feedback loop, as you and Zhang mentioned first, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll find actually you can get really far without requiring like 100 GPUs. Um, but the question I had was, I wanted to go back to uh, sort of the beginning of your talk. You said that the a lot of the your experience of that what you were going to be talking about in your talk mm -hmm. was for classification, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned GANs and reinforcement learning as places where your what you said might not apply. So I'm curious, uh, two things. One, what, like, besides GANs and reinforcement learning, can you think of any other sort of machine learning hyperparameter tuning problems that would also be different from what we just talked about that people might be working on in the audience? And then also, um, what do you think should be done differently in those categories, those types of things? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So I was drawing examples from basically the use cases I've most worked on at Weights and Biases, which is why it's like image classification and a bit of text. Um, you know, I've just uh, recently started with a regression problem where I think it kind of works a little bit differently. Um, you know, one thing there is that uh, the uh, traditional machine learning random forest baseline is actually really hard to beat. Um, and there it's almost like my recommendation would be, you know, do you need a really fancy deep learning network of, you know, millions of parameters. Um, other cases where, um, you know, I think this, the, the rabbit hole phenomena that I've, that I've mentioned is, I think once you start working on a model and pursuing a certain idea, it can have a lot of pull to it. Like, oh, I really want to make this model work or like, this is the right way to think about it, right? Especially when you're seeing good results and you can actually keep improving them from through optimization. Um, so there's something like, you know, keeping the general general approach in mind or almost like I'd love a, um, you know, a metric for like, how much compute did you use on this? Or like how many parameters are like worthwhile here? You know, if you actually pruned this network, it could be twice as small, right? Or something. Um, so things like that, I think, it can get like really exciting and powerful when you're running a sweep and turning these deep deep nets, right? But um, it might not always be necessary. Yeah, definitely a, a plus one for um, consider random forests there. But yeah, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of tabular data out there and random forests are kind of like designed for tabular data and they can be very good. Um, uh, I just, so I, 
maybe I missed it and you touched on this, but for uh, applications like GANs and reinforcement learning, do you have any thoughts, uh, like any experiences that you've had with what hyperparameters are more or less important in those cases? Yeah, that's a good question. I have not um, run extensive sweeps specifically on those things. Um, usually in those, the, the works that I've you know, been reproducing are already like very finely tuned over a long time. So the kinds of things that I've played with are like um, relative weights of discriminator and generator loss, right? Or if there's even like multiple loss components, how do we combine those, right? One, um, one number that always seems pretty magical to me in papers is like a, a lambda coefficient that weighs you know, several different things relative to each other and how often it seems to be that like 0.5 or like even weighting is the magical number. So I think playing with something like that could give you a lot of, a lot of leverage. Um, in terms of reinforcement learning, um, yeah, I feel like the setup would have to be pretty different, um, but I'm excited to try that at some point with existing sweeps. Cool, yeah, I think, uh... Yeah, starting from a uh, an existing like implemented baseline, whenever that's possible. Like my three favorite things to compare a neural net performance to are like the linear model, logistic regression, linear regression, mm -hmm. whatever. Like a random of like relatively simple off the shelf random forest type model, maybe with like maybe gradient boosted trees if it's you know really fan if I'm really feeling fancy, and then something that somebody else has tried before just so that I can get some of that sense of scale of like when, like what is really good performance, what is really bad performance, what's a meaningful, um, what's a meaningful improvement and what's me just sitting at the slot machine pulling and trying to yeah. find a new reward, yeah. Thanks. Uh, all right, so Danny in, uh, on YouTube asks, uh, if, you, if you experience feature drift, do you go to the entire hyperparameter optimization process? Ah, feature drift. So like when a model is deployed in practice and then it turns out that, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. well, I haven't, um, I haven't worked with an example like that, at least in the weights and biases context. Um, in my previous uh, work lives, it would, um, it was a problem that happened and basically there would be a retrain cycle for the model just because the data does change and um, you know for classification like a bigger question is do the target labels change um, in, in certain contexts right if you're um, if, if new hashtags arise um, or um, if new instances are added cool uh, Han asks uh, how do you recommend we automate the model retraining or training with more epochs uh, with all of the data once a good a set of hyperparameters has been found um, yeah um, great question I think you could you could probably figure out how to use like a github action for that or something maybe it could be a weights and biases feature I think the the um, the main or the, the relevant point that I brought up here is I find it really useful to have the same script uh, be able to run in both sweep mode and individual test mode. And then you can have, say, you know, a, a command line shortcut flag to run the whole thing. Um, you could set up a report that makes sure to revisit that stage. Um, we don't have, you know, end to end automation to make that easy right now, but um, that's a great idea. Thanks. All right, those are all the questions. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Would you, is your talk gonna be public? Would you like to plug that in? Oh, um, yes. I Well, I think you might need to be at the conference, um, okay. but it's it's ML Ops. Uh, you should check it out. There's lots and lots of talks. Um, it's, it's all virtual. Um, and I think tickets are pretty affordable. It's not like CVPR, so yeah. Nice. All right, thank you, Stacey. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. This is a great time. The, all the three talks were great. Alex is still here. Thank you, Alex, for sticking around. Uh, uh, thank you for everyone who's still here with us. Um, I was joking to Charles earlier that no matter how many talks we schedule, they fill up to 
fill this two and a half hour time slot that we have because we've done four talks which filled this much time five talks which also filled two and a half hours and today we just did three but it's still here we are uh thank you guys for sticking around we'll see you again two weeks from now we do this every uh, other tuesday uh, and we'll post the link uh, and the dates um, in the Slack community, as well as on our Twitter. Also, Alex will be doing an AMA with us, which you can also find the details of that um, in the Slack community and on our Twitter account. Uh, and you can come and ask him all the other questions you didn't get to ask him. Um, and that's it. Good night.